have for the first time in this channel an interview. We're talking about music and I have here Marcelo Vig. As a drummer, Vig worked with big names like Eminem, Avril Lavigne, Will Smith, Kelly Rowling, Patrick Wolf, and also he opened for M1 House in her American tour. Hi, I'm Sira. I was born in an artistic family and as an agent, manager and producer, I've worked for many years selling artists from all around the world. Today, I want to help you to become a full-time artist. Hello artists, welcome back to my channel. I am Suira and I will help you to become a full-time artist. Today, we have for the first time in this channel an interview. Yes, that's right. So today, we're talking about music and I have here with me Marcelo Vigi. Marcelo Vigi is a drummer, a producer and an educator. He was born in Rio, but he lived and worked in London for a long time. Today, Marcelo Vigi is working an independent career, performing his own songs. Welcome, Marcelo. Tell me a little bit more about all this story. <laughs> I have a long time uh, working in London. Uh, for 10 years, I lived and worked there. I had the pleasure of doing a few sessions, mostly TV sessions with these big name artists and touring extensively with Patrick Wolf. The first leg we did in America was uh, supporting Amy Winehouse for 12 or 13 dates. It was it was pretty cool. It was it was she wasn't yet such a huge star. She wasn't on her way up, and uh, it's quite interesting to have lived through that time and to have toured America a few times also and played you know played in Europe, Australia, Japan, even Brazil with Patrick Wolf, working as a session player as a freelance musician. Okay, let's go. Let's start with the beginning. How did you discover that you are in love with music and that you want to be a full-time musician and that was your fate? Well, that was in Rock and Rio 1 in 1985. I was watching a show by Ozzy Osbourne and uh, the drummer started soloing and his name is Tommy Aldridge and uh, it, he went like crazy, he went berserk and started soloing with his hands and all that. I was just like 14 and I went crazy. I was like, wow, uh, this, this is what I want to do in my life. So romantically speaking, it was there and then. It was like a lightning in my head. It was like, whoa, this, I want that. But then it became a, you know, a long process where uh, I started studying drums. And then from that, I went to uh, music university to, for, as a, I got a teacher, a music teacher degree, and then joining all sorts of bands and stuff. At that time, my main goal was to be in a rock band, rock or pop band. It was mostly rock and roll or that kind of stuff. And back then in the, in the early 90s, you, you only had the opportunities if you were uh, signed to a label. There wasn't, you know, the, the, the music business was very different. I joined a few bands in, in, and probably maybe just like many people they all failed one opportunity i had a band that we actually signed to the newly arriving in brazil mca records which then became universal records and that, that was quite a moment being signed you know signed the contract we, we practically signed in the studio uh, because we started recording before we signed because they were pretty uh, up to signing us so we started recording with uh, legendary producer in Brazil called Liminha is someone who has produced lots of people maybe some people know the band Mutantes that has the, the album Technicolor and that and now then then I had a two-year roller coaster ride in the, in the music industry as a band and then that um, kind of the band disbanded and um, I went to London to study drums and people will say, well, it's a university, why didn't you, you know, why London, why drums? It's because the university I went to didn't have drums. You know, after everything fell apart, I decided I wanted to study abroad and then I, I was able to go to London. I fell in love with the city and I fell in love literally for a girl who ended up marrying. In the end, I went, you know, I came back to Brazil and then 
eventually went back to London and that is pretty much um, a, a quick um, a summed part of it yeah and how it works this contract that you're talking about uh, how this major label came to you and they discovered you somehow were you going after them how it worked it used to be demo tapes we had to make three songs cassette tapes I don't know if everyone knows what it is but um, we had to give out cassette tapes with the demo sound of what we were doing and at that time one of the band members knew the girlfriend of this producer and uh, we did a gig we, we gave him a demo tape that recorded at my place in a four, four track cassette tape <laughs> recorder uh, he, he thought it was quite interesting despite of the bad recording quality and he went to the concert and he thought we were pretty cool and then he recommended us to the um, to the guys at MCA they were really uh, were establishing themselves but before that all my other bands we were you know going through the same process and giving out demo tapes and trying this and that and the other and playing concerts and anything we could you know do to get noticed but it was quite a battle because you had so many doors you had to you know knock you, you didn't have direct access as today's so we were deeply dependent on other people more than being able to do it ourselves and that's quite a difference today where you have access to the production means i.e. in the same computer I'm speaking to you I can make a record we can release our stuff we can release our music on SoundCloud we can release our music on Spotify or you know all, all the DSPs or YouTube you can have a channel I mean having a channel is like something unthinkable you know well, the only thing we could think of channel wise was TV and and it was pretty hard to get on TV all the technology was extremely expensive so it was way out of reach for 99% of the common people and and we we needed that in order to make anything so with the new you know technology newish technology we can already make our stuff we can we have full control of what we're doing so it means we have full control of costs of gains of you know of you know profits or losses and we know we can know fully well where we're going that is no guarantee of anything but it does give you the power to be at the helm of your own career it helps you quite a lot to to plan ahead or even if you don't plan ahead but it gives you a lot of resources to you know find your fan base to feed your fan base and and start growing a growing process with them and it makes you easily uh, accessible online people can find you at a click of a mouse that is pretty much the difference and and I, I think there's two as everything is, is is a is a double blade sword you, you, you actually have access to everything but everyone else has it too how's that so, <laughs> so, so it's true. Like, uh, how do I get myself noticed in the notion of 40 thousand records being uploaded daily to Spotify I don't have an answer to that like a direct answer what I can say is do what you do and try and do try and do your best you know don't neglect any part of the process try and record as best as you can try and you know figure out a storytelling of what you're doing figure out a way that you communicate with your people that you you're after don't be afraid to copy models that have been working for other people in in a way to inspire what you're doing not like stealing what people are doing but mm -hmm. copying cop not like a copycat but like a copy of you know the way you know in, in an inspired way try and get in touch constantly with whatever fan base you have if you don't have any well start you know closely your friends your 
relatives, you know, your friends in your own street, in your own borough. If you're young enough, you know, at uni or at school, you, you know, start that process. That's how you do it. There's no guarantee. But what is, what, there's one thing that's guaranteed. If you don't do it, you won't have it. That's, you know, that's pretty much totally guaranteed. If you don't try, you won't get it. So, you know, if, if that's your dream, if you want to become a full-time artist, what I, what, I, what I would say to people is try and embrace music as a whole, as one thing. If, you, if you're into music just to, you know, be a successful artist, you're, you're, you know, it's a one place that you want to be in a you know in an infinity of positions that you can be in a music business you can be a, you can be a musician you can be an artist you can be an artist in a band you can be a solo artist you can be a producer a music teacher you can be you can work in record labels you can have your own channel in youtube you can you know yeah <laughs> that's amazing and especially because you did most of these things that you're saying right yes. you're a producer you were in a band you were by yourself you were as a yep. dj so uh for you what's the biggest difference between uh you were in the band so you're working with other people and you were in this team and sometimes you have someone like a manager or a label or something that is on top of you giving you directions or helping you to go to one place or to a festival or to a tv show and how is to do everything by yourself but respecting your music your creativity and putting your soul on it not just being accepting the other's rules <laughs> when you're in a collective situation you you it's not that you accept, but you have to negotiate. There's always a point of compromise. It's like the music and, and the band identity will not be 100% anyone's. It will be a part of everyone. If you look at big successful bands, sometimes one member tries a solo career or you know they try you know parallel projects you may even like them you know the parallel projects or not but when you put those people together is when the magic happens so you you, you know say the rolling stones you have you know mick jagger has a few solo albums keith richards has a few solo albums and so on but when you put those people together is when it goes boom so there is a chemistry that has to happen and that's anyone's guess that's you know that's not something that we can explain it just happens and so when you're collectively working you, you need to be open-minded you need to be generous and you need to be assertive and firm at the same time it's a bit of a ball game you have to go you know the, the ball has everyone has to have a go at kicking the ball towards the goal is mostly and mainly about not who is going to score the goal, but who is, you know, make the band or your collective win the championship. So it doesn't matter who is showing, you know, who's been shown more on TV or, you know, whose picture or, you know, that's, that's just vanity and that's just ego. So when you're in a collective, you have to kind of keep your ego in check. And at the same time, find your place quickly where where you are where you know how you how you deal with the people in your band and how you deal with the people you know when you say above you i think above you it's not such thing as above you it's like who your partners are so if you sign to a to a record label they're not your boss but you have you know, you must have a good relationship with them in order to make things work but remember that you're not friends or family it's business when you're working with a manager it's pretty much the same. You you need to work as a partnership. You need to be, you know, working together towards a, a common goal. And at the same time, there's no one above you. When you're talking about management, the artist is the boss rather than the manager being your boss, because the manager will take a cut of the band or of the artist. So, who is in charge is the artist anyway. Whenever you're in a position of being the, the, the artist, either collectively or solo, you are at the helm of your career. You are the boss. But that doesn't mean bossing people around is something very different. You need to work in a, in a sort of a flow. 
you know, you need to try and, and, and keep the, f the energy flow going. The main difference between working collectively and solo is that when you're solo then, you don't have anyone to argue with in a band in the first place. But at the same time, you have a bigger responsibility upon yourself when you, when you have to create the music, put the music out there, you have to think almost entirely by yourself how you're going to do this, you know, the whole creative process falls upon you. Again, you have, you know, the good side and the bad side of it. The good side is that it's cheaper. You don't have to commute. You don't have to, you know, there's a lot of expenses that you don't have. But when the expenses come, you send the check alone. So that's, you know, both sides of it. You may not argue with other people, but you surely will have arguments within your head. When I'm producing my stuff, I'm mostly wearing three hats. It's the producer, the artist and the engineer. And a lot of times I have huge arguments in my head. You know, all those three people are arguing with, you know, no, I want that as an artist. No, but that's that's shit. as a producer. I have to tell you. And then as a sound engineer, no, man, that's not sounding good. No, but I like it. And it's like a whole a whole argument between three different identities. But what? I strongly recommend that you, you know, if you're going solo, find people that you can trust and that you can um, create bonds, you know, work bonds with those people, be it a manager, be it a label, do collabs, whatever it is, have people that you trust that you can send your music to before, you know, before you release and be brave um, because there's no one, you know, there's nowhere to hide. I'll give you an example. I DJ'd at um, Rock in Rio in 2001 in the um, dance tent. And I was playing at the time, I was, I was DJing with vinyl. We didn't have any CDRs or anything like that. A CD, sorry, CDJs and, you know, no Pioneer, no record box. It was just vinyl. Before that, I had played festivals and I had played big concerts with bands and all that. And I was behind the drum kit and it was brilliant. But then this time I was the DJ. I was on my own and uh, I had DJed in clubs, I had DJs in other places, uh, never had DJed in a festival before. It was probably one of the biggest adrenaline rushes I've ever had because for some reason that thought came across my mind, I was like, oh wow, it's just me. <laughs> if I screw up, it's me. There's no one in the band, there's no, you know, it's me, it's, it's, it's all on me. I wish I had never thought about that. <laughs> but then uh, it was a very hot day in Rio and uh, a few minutes before going on stage I was wet in my face. And when I started playing, uh, you know, you, you don't stop DJing. You, you know, the first DJ leaves the record playing and you go, you know, with your vinyl that used to be like that. You go with your vinyl and you mix into whatever he has left for you. I couldn't. I was like, my, my hand was like shaking like that to, you know, to hold the stylus and I was like, ah, and I couldn't cue the record properly. And uh, what I did was to use an old trick that is, um, I got my record on cue miraculously and I just turned off the other turntable and I went, and I was controlling the other vinyl making, you know, and then I came up with my album and, you know, I was like, oh, okay, that's, I, could, I just couldn't. I had done it many times before, but at that time, this thought came through my mind. I was like, oh shit, it's only on me. I'm not saying that to discourage anyone. I'm just saying it's different. Yeah. And uh, when I when I went, when I came to uh, release my solo album, I had also to prepare a show and I was like, how am I going to do this? And then I started, that's how I prepared. I made, uh, I booked something like seven or eight gigs before the launch. I didn't want to come cold on stage, like, oh, this is my first album, my first album, my first, you know, the release show, um, and it's my first time on stage solo, I, I, I wouldn't do that. So what I can tell you also is to plan that. If, you, if you're going from a collective to solo, or if you're starting solo, prepare yourself. Don't put yourself in a, in a position of just going out there be, just because I'm brave. At that time, I decided I was like unable to face the stage outside of the drum kit. So I started doing something like a course, like a 
theater im im improvising course, like uh, whose line is it anyway, that kind of stuff. The scene you will be acting out is uh, entitled One Night in a Sketchy Neighborhood. <laughs> Take it away. And it helped me greatly, but that's me. I mean, you, you don't have to do it. But what I'm saying is prepare yourself, both as a band and as a solo artist. And how did you decide to take this leap and not be in a band anymore and be solo? I was fed up with being in bands. <laughs> too much confusion, what happens? <laughs> it's too much democracy. At one point, I, I had come to a point where I just wanted to express myself without having to go through anyone's opinion or anyone's filter. I had already not been playing in bands since 2007 when I had a band in London called Device and then I was called in to do the Patrick Wolves tour and I couldn't stay in a band anymore and um, I just went freelancing until, you know, and I still do freelance work but then in 2014, I, uh, to, around 2013, I started having some inspiration to do the stuff that I wanted, which was to mix my drumming with electronic music, uh, writing some tracks and all that. I kind of encouraged myself into do it, into do it, into doing it. <laughs> and it's kind of, it's kind of like, it's something that I had to do. It's, it's more like a calling than I decided to. I like nowadays. I like working in collaborations as well. You know, me and, and someone else. I think that quite works for me. So I have the uh, this project where you worked in Compu Tambor That was <laughs> it's a duo. It's me and another percussionist named Marco Susano. He's one of the biggest musicians on the planet. We we started this thing of doing it, only drums and percussion and, and computers. Then it kind of expanded to other musicians, but mainly as a duo. That's that's the place where I like to be working as well, not only as a solo, but as a, as a duo. And tell me a little and, and bit I, more of the other things that you're doing. So since you were talking about the computer board, yeah, you're doing um, other things, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm currently trying to finish an, um, another solo work. I don't know if it's going to be an EP or an album, because last year it was 35 years since I started. Oh, congrats! From the Rock and Rio one, but then the pandemics happened, and I couldn't release anything last year. And now I'm trying to finish this this thing, which is a pretty kind of crazy drumming with crazy computing, and and not giving much of a monkeys to to the industry or to the market. It's just for you know for loving what I do, but at the same time they're quite user friendly tracks, so it's not just the crazy out there stuff. And since then I've become pretty much a full-time teacher. I've uh, become an Ableton certified trainer, which is a software that I've used and loved using it since 2008. And that has opened a lot of doors to me and to my creativity also. So I'm keeping myself with the teaching classes, private classes or online, mostly online and also teaching at um, very respectable school in Brazil called IMAC. That's how I'm keeping myself. And as well, meantime, I've joined Universal Publishing, Universal Music Publishing, and I write for them. I do songwriting camps. Only now there's like a soundtrack of a, of a, of a feature film that was meant to be released in 2018, but only now is, is, is going out. Yeah, it's all, all the stuff that I've been doing. And, and, and it's ex exactly what I said before. If you're going to embrace music or whichever other art form you're embracing embrace it wholesomely um, not just one position if, you, if you're there just to become the star singer or the star whatever you, you're in the wrong place it, the chances of becoming that the way you want it is very slim but if you want to be in a music business or in the music as your bread and butter you may embrace all sorts of forms and you know be open-minded be be generous uh with with yourself and with others and and mostly be open-minded because sometimes you have opportunities that you will let pass because you are so framed into doing something that you you let opportunities pass by you the, the art field is, is a place where you can plant 
lemons and and come out with oranges and and it should be it should be all right with that because it happens most of the time you you will plant you know lemons and come out with something else you know mangoes whatever yeah this is something that i like and i say uh here on the channel several times that if you love art maybe it's not exactly just being an artist, but you can be a teacher, you can collaborate with other artists, maybe uh, if you're a musician, you can collaborate with the movie, as you were saying before, not just with other musicians. And the more open-minded you are, more things can happen for you. And if if you're an artist and you are working with art, I think it's, everything should be okay, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you look at, um, I don't know if you can hear this, like someone breaking walls, Yes, I can hear, unfortunately, but well, it happens. Yeah, it's pandemics, right? Um, what? Well, yeah, I do agree with you. And if you look at big name artists, they were always open minded about stuff. Yeah, always, you know, from presenting a TV show to, you know, I don't know, to singing in the stadiums or singing in small venues. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at you know, if you look closely at those people, they're pretty much open-minded to anything. Yes, I totally agree. Thank you so much for being here with me today. And that's the first time that I have this interview and I think it was super great to have your experience here. You worked with several different things in different places, different countries, different people. So you imagine that you have lots of experience to show here. And if people want to know a little bit more about you, if they are interested in your music or in your works, how they can look for you. The main place is my website is www.marcelovig.com um, I'm also in the, in the Ableton page as a, as a certified trainer and on Instagram is uh, at marcelo.vig and that's, that's the easiest way to find me. On the web page there's a lot of links to everywhere so Spotify, everything is on, a, it's on, a, it's on the web page. Oh, that's perfect. I will also put everything here in the description section below <laughs> so people can just click there. And again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I still have some questions put here in the comment section below, but maybe I can help you a little bit better, right? I have a free ebook in my website that will help you step by step. So you can go here in the description of this video so you can click there. See you. Thank you so much for keeping doing your.